post it to YouTube later. At this time, let me give me one second while I ask the team to start the recording. Okay, we are now recording. Today's hearing is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Mike Lee, and I will be the lead judge. Judge Josef Akopchekian and Judge Shireen Reiner are the other members of this tax appeals panel. Also, also present is our stenographer, Ms. Chung, who is reporting this hearing verbatim. To ensure we have an accurate record, we ask that everyone speaks one at a time and does not speak over each other. Also, speak clearly and loudly. When needed, Ms. Chung will stop the hearing process and ask for clarification. After the hearing, Ms. Chung will produce the official hearing transcript, which will be available on the Office of Tax Appeals website. This hearing is being conducted in person in Cerritos, California, and is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube later. At this time, I would like to offer a few reminders to help this process run as smoothly as possible. When you need to speak, please turn on your microphone and speak directly into your microphone. If you are not speaking, turn off your microphone. Please do not interrupt when someone else is speaking. Each side will have the opportunity to be heard, so please wait for when it's your turn to present your side. Please also answer verbally, no nodding or shaking of the head. Also, I would like to remind the parties that the Office of Tax Appeals is not a court, but is an independent appeals body. The office is staffed by tax experts and is independent of the state's tax agencies. Are there any questions about what I just said before we go on the record? Respondent, Franchise Tax Board, any questions? No questions. Thank you. And turning to appellant, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Let me check m with my co panelists to see if we're ready to go on the record. Judge Acop, check in. Are you ready to go on the record? I'm ready. Thank you. And Judge Reiner? Ready. Thank you. Thank you. Let me also check with our stenographer. Thank you. We are now going on the record. We are opening the record in the appeal of Shire. This matter is being held before the Office of Tax Appeals. The OTA case number is 191-25583. Today's date is Tuesday, February 14, 2023. And the time is 2.04 p.m. This hearing is being held in person in Cerritos, California. Today's hearing is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Mike Lee, and I will be a lead judge. Judge Josef Akopchekian and Judge Shireen Reiner are the other members of this tax appeals panel. All three judges will meet after the hearing and produce a written opinion as equal participants. Although the lead judge will conduct the hearing, any judge on this panel may ask questions or otherwise participate to ensure we have all the information needed to decide this appeal. Now, for the record, for the Will the parties please state their names and who they represent? Starting with Respondent, Franchise Tax Board. Uh, Nathan Hall on behalf of the Respondent Franchise Tax Board. Thank you. Jackie Zumaitet, Z-U-M-A-E-T-A -E on behalf of the Franchise Tax Board. Thank you. And for Repellent. And Robert Fedor on behalf of Daniel Schreier. Thank you. Let's move on to my minutes and orders. As discussed with the parties at a second pre-hearing conference on January 17, 2023, and notated in my minutes orders, there are five issues in this matter. The first is whether an appellant may exclude from income approximately $15 million in capital gain for the 2012 taxable year for California tax purposes. The second is whether an appellant is entitled to claim a passive activity loss deduction with respect to the residential property located on Crest Court in Beverly Hills, California. The third is whether an appellant is entitled to claim a carryover loss with respect to the activity at the Crest Court property in the 2012 taxable year. Related to this issue is whether an appellant needs to prove his 2011 loss relating to the Crest Court property after, after, the, FT, after the FTB withdrew its assessment for the 2011 tax year. 
The fourth is whether, is whether an appellant is entitled to deduct a capital loss of $860,330 from the sale of the Crest Court property. And the fifth is whether an appellant is liable for the late filing penalty. Respondent has conceded the accuracy related penalty. No witnesses will testify at this hearing for either party. Also, appellants exhibits 1 through 12 and respondents exhibits A through BB were entered into the record in my minutes and orders. After the pre-hearing conference, appellants submitted exhibits 13 through 16 and respondents submitted exhibits CC through EE. Neither party submitted an objection by the deadline notated in my minutes and orders. So exhibits 13 through 16 and exhibits CC through EE are entered into the record. This oral hearing will begin with a presence presentation for up to 30 minutes. Does anyone have any questions before we begin with a presence presentation? Respondent, Franchise Tax Board, any questions? No questions, Judge. Thank you. And Appellant, any questions? No questions, Judge. Thank you. Okay. Um, Appellant, you have up to 30 minutes for your presentation starting at 2.07 p.m. Please proceed. Thank you very much, and thank you, panel. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. It's my first time before the OTA. I came in from Cleveland, Ohio last night. So uh, look forward to this, and thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, j just to reiterate quickly, there's three macro issues in this case. One is the capital gain issue, uh, the $15 million, which arose from the sale of real estate to an unrelated entity in the state of Colorado. The second uh, macro issue relates to this Crest Court property in Beverly Hills, California. It's rental real estate property. The issue is whether it was entered into with a profit motive. The issue is whether it was sold at a loss, the basis for that. And, and I look at, it, at that as a macro issue related to that Crest Court property. The third issue is related to the uh, delinquency penalty for the late filing of a 2012 uh, tax return and uh, I, I will concede that at this hearing, there's, there's not a reasonable basis for not filing a, a timely tax return in this case. So that one's off uh, off target already. Uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Just to make sure taxpayer concedes the late filing penalty? That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you. So I'm going to take the issues a little bit out of order here this afternoon and address the capital gains issue Second, the, the issue with regard to the Crest Court property really runs through most of the argument for appellants, and, and I'd like to address that in two or three different um, uh, sections. One is the profit motive. Uh, Daniel Schreier is a professional real estate investor. This is what he's done for decades. It's what he's done as a career. And you can see from all the exhibits entered as part of the record that Mr. Schreier has numerous interests in real estate. He has them personally held, and in fact, that's the capital gain issue, the $15 million capital gain issue is as a result of one of uh, a related real estate investment that he has. And so one of the things that respondent has disallowed in, in their proposed assessment is that this transaction wasn't entered into with a profit motive. So 2008, 2009 timeframe, this, this property, Crest Court, is related to Ed McMahon, the old, uh, the, the gentleman that passed away, it was on the Johnny Carson show. It was, it was his uh, uh, residence. It was his residence. And Ed McMahon was faltering in his health. It was 2008, 2009. It was a real estate crisis. Everybody remembers how bad it was in 2008 and 2009. And the house was in foreclosure. And Mr. Schreier purchased that note purchased it out of foreclosure and converted it to uh, rental real estate. And you will hear from respondent that, well, there was only sporadic rent paid. There wasn't much paid going along. There really wasn't a profit motive. But that's, that's not the only thing that this panel should consider. It's not just the landlord-tenant relationship which existed between the parties, but my client, Mr. Schreier, appellant herein, oftentimes makes his profit from the disposition of the asset. 
And so this was purchased in 2009. Substantial improvements were made to the property. True and conceded there wasn't a lot of rent collected. Uh, but improvements were made to the property. There is an affidavit from Mrs. McMahon, who uh, was a survivor. Uh, Ed McMahon passed away during this time period. And she indicated she was of a belief that this was a landlord-tenant relationship between the parties. She did her best to pay sporadic rent. It wasn't paid often. But Schreier, in this instance, had the expectation, like he does for all his other investments, where he would reap the rewards in 2012 when this uh, real estate was actually sold. And so the market was still bad. But if you take a look at the 2012 Schedule E on, on the individual tax return, there's at least nine different parcels of real estate of which he holds as a real estate investor. Respondent itself cites throughout their briefing that Mr. Schreier is a real estate investor. So I don't know how they can argue on the one hand that this wasn't entered into for a profit motive, but on the other hand say that he's actually a real estate investor, this is what he does. And this is all that Mr. Schreier has done his entire life and continues to do so today. And sometimes he hits big, sometimes he loses money, but this is what he does for a living. And that's, that's replete through the, the record and the, the tax filings in this case. Uh, so, so, so that's the first part regarding the profit motive. Uh, it's important to note also that originally this matter involved taxes 2011 and 2012. And the 2011 Notice of Proposed Assessment was withdrawn in 2020. Uh, you're going to hear from respondent, I'm sure, that that is irrelevant. There still needs to be the losses proved up for 2011. Uh, however, appellants would argue that uh, that issue is now res judicata and they should be a stop from arguing uh, uh, what was done in 2011 other than as it relates to basis. Because we all know sitting here that basis is always relevant for determinations of gains or losses uh, at the point of disposition. But what's important in this case is you have suspended losses from these periods. You have 2009 when the purchase was made. You have 2010. You have 2011. All these were suspended losses by and large, very little of which was claimed in the current year. And in 2012, it, it, the first couple of days of 2012 is when the property was sold, and it was sold at a loss. And that is when the suspension of the losses is released, and Mr. Schreier should be able to claim those losses. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a typical passive activity investment where you're not allowed to, you're, you incur the losses, but you're not allowed to take them until the asset is disposed of. And in 2012, this asset was disposed of, and that is our argument certainly for the losses being carried forward into 2012 and those being released into the 2012 tax year, but it's a separate issue then related to the basis argument. So those are two separate issues, obviously both of which relate to uh, Crest Court. That's why I've broken out Crest Court first, because that's the majority of the issues in this case. So go, going back to the profit motive argument, uh, just just briefly, and, and we cite in our uh, response brief that there's several factors which go into the determination of whether a taxpayer has a profit motive uh, for an investment activity like this. And, and the first question would call into mind, uh, did the taxpayer conduct the activity in a business-like manner? And here, the taxpayer kept track of all income and expenses, like he does for all his other real estate activities. He has a bookkeeper in charge. Uh, he invested in the property. He paid for repair and maintenance costs. He paid for substantial improvements to the property, all of which are reflected uh, in the books and records and on the tax returns uh, filed by Mr. Schreier. Uh, as I indicated, uh, it's notated as Exhibit 4 made part of a record that Mrs. McMahon submitted an affidavit regarding her attempts to pay rent after her husband had passed away and that she was of a belief that there existed a landlord-tenant relationship between the parties. And this is this is a short-term transaction. 
2009 to 2012. By the first week of 2012 in January, this asset was disposed of. Uh, you see there's tentative closing documents uh, for the last week, two weeks of December, but it ultimately closed the first week of January uh, 2012. Uh, the, the second factor determining profit motive is the expertise of a taxpayer. Uh, appellant's a real estate professional. He has been for decades. Um, as I've stated previously, the, the actual gain related to the Colorado asset, which we'll discuss briefly and shortly, uh, that's also from his activities as a real estate professional. He has a multitude of different disclosures on Schedule E through different pass-through entities, typically a single-member LLC, which is what also held Crest Court. This is what this gentleman does all over the world. He has investments in Bali. He has investments throughout California. This was a Colorado investment. Just to give you some background, the investments were typically back in the day, and what's at issue here, uh, Mr. Schreier would buy dilapidated buildings typically out of a Chapter 11 bankruptcy or Chapter 7 bankruptcy. They would take these old buildings and convert them to server farms. And, and that was a growing business during that time frame. And they'd lease up these uh, server farms to Fortune 100 companies, and then they'd turn around, sell it, and that's how they made their money. Uh, and he was one person amongst many in these different investments. And so if you were to see, which isn't part of the record, tax returns from Mr. Schreier inside and outside these periods, you would see that periodically he does really well and he might make 10, 20, or $30 million, but he also may lose significant amounts in off years where he's pumping money into these investments, but he doesn't have a return yet. Because what's key on this is the end, the disposition of the asset, not the current maintenance, the repairs, the improvements to the asset. That's all obviously suspended losses, which are then, as I said, released uh, upon disposition of the asset. So, uh, so that's, that's the second issue regarding the profit motivation. The, the third factor that goes into profit motivation is the time and effort by the taxpayer in the activity. Uh, and I'll state for this panel, this is one of many assets that Mr. Schreier had in this time frame. He had a bookkeeper involved. He wasn't day-to-day -day involved with this, but this is not your typical uh, rental real estate investor, uh, certainly not a uh, residential real estate investor. He's more along the lines of a commercial real estate investor or building or apartment investor. Um, so this is just one in, in several of his portfolio. And he has, as I indicated, on the 2011-2012 income tax returns, he has at least nine different rental real estate activities on the return, and some of which have uh, uh, passive income, some of which have passive losses, and everywhere in between. So you know, th this fit right into his portfolio, and the, the real, we wouldn't be here today on this issue, but for, he purchased it uh, back in 2009, but there was an expectation that the market would turn, certainly out here in California and elsewhere. And when this was sold in 2012, the market still wasn't good. And so he, he incurred a loss uh, from the sale of it in 2012. So that, that's the pro profit motivation issues. And I, I don't think there's any, uh, any, any, anything that this panel should take issue with that he was looking to earn a profit. I don't see where respondent uh, could ever excuse me, could ever see where this wasn't entered into with a profit motivation. This is all this guy does. And historically, he's made a lot of money o over the years um, from r real estate investments. As I stated, the, uh, the 2011 loss, which uh, I believe is stipulated to uh, by respondent as well, from the Crest Court property is $455,320. That was the issue where it was a notice of proposed assessment, and for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, the FTB withdrew that notice of proposed assessment. So it's appellant's position that the four hundred fifty-five thousand dollar loss taken on the two thousand eleven return should be allowed in full, and then included as part of the passive activity losses, which were suspended until two thousand twelve, when the property was disposed of. That's the two thousand eleven issue related to that. Um, I think what you'll hear from uh, from respondent is that that still that issue still needs to be proven up. 
Uh, it's appellant's position that since they withdrew the proposed assessment, the tax return stands on, it own, on its own. Uh, they should be stopped from arguing that. It's, it's not a basis argument. It's the loss which was taken as a current year deduction on the 2011 tax return. Had the FTB wanted to litigate that issue, they should not have withdrawn uh, the notice of proposed assessment. We'd still be we'd be sitting here today discussing that issue. But because they took the action of withdrawing the proposed assessment, uh, appellant argues that they are uh, uh, stopped, as I said previously, from from making that argument and uh, asserting that that number is still at issue and still in controversy. The next issue I'd like to address with regard to the Crest Court property uh, are the basis computations. Uh, appellant submits that he has uh, substantiated a loss in the amount of $860,000. Uh, the FTB would submit that the loss is $469,165. Uh, I think some of that is related to uh, the, the misunderstanding and either depreciation or otherwise, but what I would submit to the panel here today is that the property was purchased uh, and s purchase price was $3.8 million. That is Mr. Schreier, the appellant here, taking over the note that was due countrywide that the McMahons had. Uh, the property was then sold in 2012. Uh, the There, in, in addition to that, there was, and I'm referring to Exhibit Y of respondents' uh, uh, submissions to the record, uh, and, and all of these are numbers which are predominantly agreed to. Uh, there's additional basis of $467,516. There's cost basis of 4.267516. That's $4,267,516. And then the proceeds from sale are $3,078,810, and that's Exhibit V uh, in the record. Uh, and the loss from the sale, cash on cash loss, is $1,188,706. Of course, we all know when you're uh, computing gain for tax purposes, then you have to back out with depreciation that was previously taken. So you back out with depreciation taken for 2009, 2010, and 2011. And that totals $322,710. That's stipulated to between the parties. And that's a loss then from that transaction uh, of $865,996, which is about what was uh, addressed in the issues before the panel. Um, and the, the prior year's depreciation deductions are reflected in exhibits P, Q, and R. And, you know, uh, much of this is agreed to and stipulated to between the parties here. So it's it, this is I look at this as almost akin to a summary judgment motion, and in that, in that, ninety five percent of these facts are agreed to. The issues of law, uh, with regard to the passive activity rules, with regard to profit motivation rules, with regard to capital gain rules, and, and the basis uh, rule. So there's not a lot of issue factually between the parties, but obviously there is legally, and that's why we're here today. Uh, the last, the last issue. Then, so I'm done with Crest Court. That, that's that's the macro issues for Crest Court. Profit motive. The loss from the uh, conduction of activities on the Crest Court property, and then third, the basis issues, and the amount of the loss. And respondent concedes that there is a loss. Uh, however, we have a difference of opinion what that amount, amount of that loss actually is, and you'll hear, I'm sure, from respondent on that. Uh, the next issue then is the capital gain issue, and that's that's a fifteen million dollar issue. Uh, the FTB proposes that a capital gain adjustment in the amount of fifteen million two hundred seventeen thousand three hundred ninety one dollars be made for tax year two thousand twelve. The issue with this is that Dan Schreier, the appellant here, was not a party to the transaction. There were separate businesses and different entities which were party to that transaction. And on top of that, all of this transaction took place in Colorado. All of the tax due, 100% of the tax due, was paid to the state of Colorado at the time of the transaction. 
when the asset was disposed in 2012. Uh, and, and if you go to Exhibit 2, page 13 um, of Exhibit 2, you can see the flowchart uh, for how this transaction was actually conducted. And this was put together by FTB. And there's, there's three different entities that were involved before it even gets down to Mr. Schreier. But in our opinion, that it doesn't touch Mr. Schreier. Uh, it is an entity paid tax. And these were all uh, third party independent CPA firms which prepared these returns and which reported a transaction. And it was prepared by McGladry. Uh, and they took a position on the K1 of a 540 that this is not income that's reportable by Mr. Schreier. And, and I'll outline that in a second. Uh, but if you go to Exhibit 2, page 13, it's a flow chart of the actual transaction for the Aurora, Colorado real estate uh, sale. If I can flip to Exhibit 16 for a moment. Exhibit 16, page 90. Uh, exhibit 16 is the partnership tax return for an entity by the name of DCI Technology Holdings, LLC. That is a real estate management company. Uh, and I'm looking at a 2012 Form 1065, which was timely filed. And together with that, there's attachments for uh, the, the relevant California schedules that go with that as well as the Colorado schedules and other other states activities which were made up of that, part of that LLC. And if you look at page 90 of exhibit 16, which let me reference back to for a moment. Page 90 of exhibit 16 is a 2012 schedule K1 for the state of California, uh, member share of income deductions, credits, et cetera, related to Dan Schreier arising out of a DCI Technology Holdings LLC. And as I indicated uh, and stated, this return was prepared by an independent CPA firm uh, and reports the activities from the sale of this Aurora building in Colorado. And if you look at line 10, uh, total gain under section 1231, uh, it indicates the amounts due for federal purposes you have a $15,218,000 gain, and in California adjustments, it's removed from that. And that's the California Schedule K-1 Form 568 related to 2012 partnership return from the entity that was involved with the actual transaction. Now, if you go to, pardon me, if you go to page 106 of same Exhibit 16, that is the is the Colorado Schedule K-1, uh, and the, it's called a pa Partners uh, um, Colorado. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, let, my apologies. Let, let me interrupt. Um, when yes, you're, sir. When you're um, referring to exhibits and pages, give us a second while we catch up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So can, can you say that one more time? What, what's that page number? Uh, I'll go back first. The first one was Exhibit 16, page 90. Mm -hmm. That's a K-1 for State of Cal uh, California. Mm -hmm. The second one is Exhibit 16, page 106. Thank My you. apologies. Thank you. I have not been before VOTA before. Please proceed. Thank you very much. And so Exhibit 16, page 106, is a 2012 Colorado equivalent Schedule K-1. And uh, it's, it's for Mr. Schreier, and the partnership is DCI Technology Holdings, LLC. You will see on that it has federal income, from the sale of this real estate, sixteen million one seventy one two fifty, and then it has it modified for Colorado. For Colorado purposes, the income is sixteen million one hundred seventy one thousand two hundred fifty dollars. So there's a position taken by the CPA firm correctly that this is Colorado-based income. This is not California-based income, and so the California K1, as I said. Uh, had no in, no uh, uh, reporting of this capital gain transaction for California purposes, but it was fully reportable in the state of Colorado, and all the tax was paid on that transaction. And it, it's not relevant to my argument today, but 
you have another five or ten different states K-1s in here showing all the different activities between uh, different states. Mr. Schreier probably files on average 12 to 15 different state tax returns each and every year. And so there's always allocations and different K-1s coming through depending on what state the activity is in. And so this is just another instance of an allocation of an investment where the state tax is paid on the entity level and it's paid in full. And if you go to page 93 of the same exhibit, same exhibit 16, you can see in the panel can see that uh, on the California Schedule K-1, other information, it indicates that Colorado tax paid at the partnership level $743,306. And respondent would uh, concede that that's been paid as well. And they would stipulate to that. Mr. Schreier would argue that as a California resident, he had the duty to report his income, which included gains attributable to him. This is not a gain which is attributable to him under the code. This is a gain which is attributable to entities unrelated to Mr. Schreier. And so this is, if you go back to that flow chart, it's clear all the different entities that are involved and the lack of relationship that Mr. Schreier has to these entities. So we would argue that this gain is not attributable to the appellant, but rather to a separate, unrelated entity which already paid all the taxes which were due and owing to the state of Colorado. Um, and just in closing, in summary, uh, appellant should be entitled to a real estate loss related to his investment in the Crest Court property, to a capital loss related to the sale of Crest Court as well, and to the exclusion of the capital gain from the sale of a Colorado real estate because it's unrelated to him. And I'd like to reserve my rebuttal time if I could, panel. So it looks like you have uh, three minutes left. So you can, we can reserve that three minutes and we'll add it on to your rebuttal. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you um, for your presentation. Let me turn to the AOG panels to, to see if they have any questions for um, appellant here. Judge Acop, check in. Any questions at this moment? I have uh, one question. You indicated the uh, appellant made improvement to the property. Um, at the same time, you're indicating that the former owner was living there. Um, can you reconcile those two facts for me? Sure, the, the owner was living there at the time, but there was a new roof put on. There was, I believe there was a siding or some outdoor uh, reconstruction which took place, but the owner was there while those improvements and repairs and maintenance took place. That's correct. Thank you. Let, let me turn to uh, Judge Ryder. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can you clarify when you said the owner lives there? Are you talking about your client or during the? That would be the McMahon's. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Okay. The tenants lived there, uh, Mr. and Mrs. McMahon, while the note was purchased by my client. And my client then became a landlord, uh, and they were the tenants. But, yes. Okay. So, um Along that line, you indicate that your client is a real estate professional, and you know he, I think you said if he's pumping in money but no returns, he sells it. So I have, how can you reconcile that statement with him not receiving rent for this period of time when he wants to make a profit, but yet he's not getting at least rent during the time that he is trying to do improvements and making it so he can make a profit upon sale? 
Well, he he did receive rent of about ten thousand dollars, but that's you know that's not market uh, like is what you'll hear from respondent. And he he could have asked for and demanded rent further. Uh, I think part of the issue was, you know, in all candor, that uh, Mr. McMahon was passing, that he was in bad health, and I really think there was the expectation at the end of the uh, investment period that he'd make the profit on the back end. And there's, there perhaps should have been steps taken to collect a rent or demand the rent further. Uh, my client hoping that he'd make out at the end of a deal, not during the deal. Okay, and thank you. Um, and to follow up on that, when you said he received rent of around 10000 are you talking aggregate or monthly? It, it appears that there wasn't very many months that rent were paid. I think that was in the first year. It was 2009 or 2010. There was 10000 paid total. Total, and then? And then that was it, correct. Okay. Thank you for clarification. Thank no you. No more questions. Thank you, Judge Reiner. I, I do have one question myself right now. Um, you refer to stipulations between uh, the party, the appellant, and FTB. It, was there an actual document prepared, or, or what are you referring to? No, I, no, there was no legal stipulation prepared in this matter. Uh, I, I think we're the parties are in agreement that those. Any time I used the term stipulation, it wasn't in the legal sense. It was an agreement between the parties uh, on either the number of the issue or or something along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's now respondent's turn uh, for their presentation. You have up to 30 minutes, starting at 2.38 p.m. Please proceed. Thank you, Judge. This case involves five issues. The first is whether appellant Daniel Schreier is required to include gain from the sale of an office building in California, in California gross income. Under the California law, appellant is required to include income from all sources. The second issue is whether appellant has satisfied his burden to show he's entitled to claim passive activity loss with respect to his purported rental activity. Appellant has not met his burden to show that he's entitled to claim such a loss. The third issue is whether appellant has met his burden to show he's entitled to claim a loss in 2012 that was purportedly carried over from 2011. Appellant has not met his burden to show that he's entitled to claim such a loss. The fourth issue is whether appellant has met his burden to substantiate his purported loss from the sale of the property. Appellant has failed to substantiate his purported loss. And the fifth issue is whether appellant is liable for the late filing penalty. Um, appellant is liable for the late filing penalty and has not shown any exception to the penalty applies. Respondent will address each issue in turn. Um, um Respondent, it sounds like repellent already conceded the late filing penalty. Yes. He had, okay. Yes. Thank you. So we will, uh, respondent will not address the, the penalty, if that's all right. Thank you. The first issue involves unreported income from the sale of an office building in Aurora, Colorado. In 2012, appellant owned an interest in an office building in Colorado. Appellant's ownership interest is illustrated on page two of respondent's opening brief and is supported by respondent's exhibits D, E, and F. Appellant reported income from the sale on his form 1040 for federal tax purposes in 2012, but excluded it from California gross income as a schedule CA adjustment. This is shown on page five of respondent's exhibit B. Appellant claims that he properly excluded this income for California tax purposes as Section 1231 gain not sourced to California. Appellant points out, points to an FTB publication for non-residents and part-year residents to support this claim. However, appellant's reliance on this publication is misplaced. Appellant was a California resident in 2012 and signed, under penalty of perjury, a California resident income tax return. Pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code 17041, Subdivision A1, California residents are subject to tax on all income, regardless of source. Appellant has failed to meet his burden that income from the sale of the Colorado office building is, is excludable from California gross income. Appellant's counsel notes that the income was considered Colorado-based income by the state of Colorado. Respondent has conceded that the conditions 
have been met for appellant to receive an other state tax credit for the Colorado source income and allowed appellant an other state tax credit <clears throat> pursuant to ta Revenue and Taxation Code 18001. And respondent's calculation of the OSTC is set forth in Respondent's Exhibit H. With respect to Exhibit, uh, excuse me, with respect to Issue 2, in 2012, appellant owned a property in Beverly Hills, California. Prior to pur purchasing the property, appellant was personally acquainted with the existing owners who were in foreclosure due to their inability to pay the mortgage. Rather than list and advertise the property for rent, screen tenants, and so forth, appellant allowed the previous owner to remain in the property, largely rent-free. Nonetheless, appellant treated this property as a rental property, and throughout the period of ownership, appellant claimed net losses on his federal Schedule E with respect to the activity. Appellant claimed Schedule E losses of over $238,000 for the 2009 taxable year, over $189,000 for the 2010 taxable year, over $455,000 for the 2011 taxable year, and over $8,000 for the 2012 taxable year. This is illustrated in Respondents' Exhibits P, Q, R, and S. During the same period of ownership, <clears throat> appellant reported having received total rent from the property in 2009 in the amount of $10,000. In 2011, excuse me, 2010, 11, and 12, appellant reported having received no rent. Under Internal Revenue Code Section 183, with respect to activities not engaged in for profit, taxpayers are allowed deductions only to the extent of gains from such activity. In determining whether an activity is engaged in for profit, federal regulations state that all facts and circumstances shall be taken into account. Some of the factors normally taken into account include the manner in which the taxpayer carries on the activity, the taxpayer's history of income and losses with respect to the activity, and the financial status of the taxpayer. The regulations further state that the determination is not to be made, quote, on the basis of the number of factors indicating a lack of profit objective exceeds the number of factors indicating a pro profit ob objective or vice versa. <clears throat> In other words, certain factors may be more relevant or weigh more heavily depending on the particular facts of each case. Here, three factors previously noted are very probative under the facts. These factors strongly suggest a lack of profit motive. With respect to the manner in which the taxpayer carries on the activity, the facts indicate that appellant did not treat the activity in a business-like manner. For example, appellant failed to produce any documentation such as a listing agreement, advertisement, a rental contract, or other agreement showing rental of the property at fair value, all of which would be expected if the activity had been treated in a business-like manner. Appellant also failed to collect rent or enforce collection of rent when none was paid. To the contrary, appellant was aware of the tenant's foreclosure and prior inability to pay the mortgage on the property and specifically allowed the tenant to stay at the property without paying rent. While this is unquestionably a good deed, it is not the behavior indicative of a profit of a for-profit rental activity. With respect to the taxpayer's history of income with respect to the activity, the facts indicate the activity was not engaged in for profit. Collectively, appellant claimed over $890,000 in losses with respect to the purported rental over the period it was reported. These losses are even more striking when compared with the $10,000 in total rental income reported over the life of the activity. This factor is extremely relevant here, given the enormous losses compared with the minimal income reported, as well as the taxpayer's profession as a real estate professional. With, res with respect to the financial status of the taxpayer, <clears throat> the facts indicate the activity was not engaged in for profit. Under the applicable regulations, if a taxpayer has substantial income from other sources and derives a substantial benefit from the losses generated by the activity, this indicates a lack of profit motive. This is especially true where there are personal elements involved. Here, all three conditions are true. Appellant has significant sources of income from other activities 
including his other property interests, partnerships, and so forth. Appellant has received substantial tax benefits from the losses associated with the property and seeks to, seeks to further those benefits in this appeal. Additionally, there are elements, uh, personal elements involved, including the fact that Appellant's purpose for purchasing the property appears to be to help the prior owners who were unable to afford the property on their own. As pointed out by Appellant's counsel, Appellant typically invested in real commercial real property, not residential. All signs here point to Appellant's rental activity not being engaged in for profit. Moreover, Appellant has failed to provide any documentation affirmatively supporting his contention that the activity was engaged in for profit. Appellant bears the burden of proving respondent's determinations incorrect. While Appellant's generosity is laudable, it is not the type of activity which gives rise to a tax benefit. As to the third issue, Appellant also raises in the affirmative his position that he's entitled to claim a loss in 2012 that was generated in 2011 and related to the same purported rental activity. Appellant reported a loss of approximately $455,000 with respect to the rental activity for the 2011 taxable year. Respondent's auditor initially adjusted Appellant's California taxable income for that year, adding back the purported $455,000 loss as an addition to income. However, upon subsequent review, Respondent discovered a math error in its adjustment. Respondent failed to account for a Schedule CA adjustment wherein Appellant suspended a vast majority of the loss claimed in 2011 with respect to the property for California tax purposes. As a result of this oversight, Respondent determined that his notice of proposed assessment for the 2011 taxable year was not sustainable and withdrew the notice. Appellant seeks to claim the suspended loss in 2012. Based on Respondent's review, the suspended loss was not originally claimed on Appellant's California tax return for 2012, and Appellant raises this issue at appeal in the affirmative. The loss sought by Appellant here was generated by the alleged rental activity. Because this activity was not engaged in for profit, Appellant is not entitled to claim a loss with respect to such activity. This has been and remains Respondent's position. When a taxpayer carries a loss to a later year and claims the loss in such year, the taxpayer's entitlement to such loss depends solely on whether the taxpayer has substantiated both the existence and the amount of the loss in such later year. In the present case, Respondent's auditor issued an NPA to appellant under the mistaken belief that the loss from the rental property had been claimed in 2011. When this is later found to be under when this is found later to be untrue, Respondent withdrew the NPA accordingly, and the issue is now being properly dealt with in 2012, the year at issue. Appellant attempts to distinguish the cases cited by Respondent, including Black v. Commissioner. For example, Appellant argued on brief that uh, Appellant was actually audited for the 2011 taxable year, whereas in Black, the IRS did not audit the year in which the loss originated. First, whether Black or other cases cited by a Respondent are factually distinguishable <coughs> is irrelevant. Respondent cited Black purely for the statement of law provided by the tax court. The legal proposition set forth in Black and other cases relied on by a Respondent is that a loss which is carried forward in a <coughs> carried forward is properly disallowed by a respondent in the year claimed by the taxpayer, and the government's failure to adjust the loss in the year of origination does not preclude such adjustment in such later year. This proposition is consistently applied in other cases. Second, appellant's reading of Black is inaccurate. In that case, the tax court stated, quote, respondent's failure to audit or disallow a loss claimed on a return for one year does not stop it from disallowing an NOL carryover of that loss to a future year. Respondent notes that the court uses the word or, meaning either a failure to audit or a failure to disallow a loss does not preclude respondent from disallowing the carryover of that loss in a later year. Therefore, under Black, even a non-adjustment following an audit does not preclude respondent from disallowing a carry-forward loss in a subsequent year 
when the loss is claimed. Respondent notes again that appellant is raised in the affirmative his entitlement to the claimed losses and therefore bears the burden. To this point, appellant's position is rooted in attempts to distinguish the authorities that do not support his position, but has failed to cite to a single legal authority which actually supports his claim that respondent's withdrawal of the NPA for a different year precludes a challenge of a loss actually claimed in 2012. This is because no such authority exists. The suspended loss is properly determined in 2012, the year at issue in this case. In a supplemental brief, Appellant argues that respondent's disallowance of the 2012 rental loss amounts to a, quote, second bite at the apple. This is a red herring. This hearing is respondent's bite at the apple, and to this point, respondent has been asked to address whether res judicata or collateral estoppel apply. As to res judicata, also referred to as claim preclusion, Revenue and Taxation Code 19802 provides, quote, in the determination of any case arising under this part, the rule of res judicata is applicable only if the liability involved is for the same year as was involved in another case previously determined. Here, the case alleged to have been previously determined relates to the 2011 taxable year and corresponding NPA. However, the liability here the liability involved relates to 2012 as the loss is being claimed in this year. To be sure, in appellant's reply brief, appellant states that the 2012 taxable year, that for the 2012 taxable year, he is entitled to claim the previously suspended losses. Res judicata is not applicable here pursuant to statute. As to collateral estoppel, also referred to as issue preclusion, this doctrine generally prevents relitigation of individual issues that have already been tried and decided by a court in a previous action. The elements include, first, the issue must be precluded, the issue sought to be precluded must be identical to the issue decided in a former proceeding. Second, the issue must have been actually litigated in the former proceeding. Third, it must have been necessarily decided in the former proceeding. Fourth, the decision in the former proceeding must be final and on the merits, and finally, the party against whom preclusion is sought must be the same as or in privity with the party to the former proceeding. Here, there has been no actual litigation of the issue. This proceeding is litigation. Second, because this litigation has not been finalized, there is no final determination on the merits. Collateral estoppel is not applicable here. Moreover, collateral estoppel is based on the public policy of limiting relitigation of an issue already tried. Applying collateral estoppel in this instance would not serve the public policy underlying the doctrine. And finally, to foreclose any, foreclose any other potential argument regarding this issue, respondent would like to point out that equitable estoppel also does not apply here. Application of equitable estoppel is limited to rare circumstances where it is necessary to avoid a, quote, grave injustice. In the limited circumstances where equitable estoppel could apply, it is the taxpayer's burden to demonstrate satisfaction of the elements. Those elements include, one, the government agency must be shown to have been aware of the actual facts. The government agency must be shown to have made an inaccurate representation with the intention of having the taxpayer act on it or the government agency must have acted in a manner that the taxpayer had a right to believe that the government agency intended the taxpayer would act on its representation. Three, the taxpayer must have been ignorant of the actual facts. And four, the taxpayer must be shown to have acted on the government agency's representation to the taxpayer's detriment. Here, respondent issued a notice of proposed assessment to appellant, increasing appellant's income to disallow, to disallow a loss it believed appellant had claimed without realizing that appellant had made a Schedule CA adjustment backing out the loss for California tax purposes. Upon discovering its error, error respondent retracted its notice of, of proposed assessment. In this case, the taxpayer signed his tax return and therefore cannot reasonably claim ignorance as to the actual facts, including the existence of the Schedule CA adjustment. Second, there is no evidence of detrimental reliance in respect to the 2011 NPA or with respect to respondent's position regarding rental losses for 2012. It has been from the beginning and remains respondent's position 
that appellant is not entitled to claim the aforementioned losses with respect to the purported rental activity. Uh, moving on to issue four, appellant subsequently sold the property at Crest Court, claiming a substantial loss as a result of the sale. In determining gain or, lo or loss from the sale of property, Internal Revenue Code Section 1001 provides that the amount of gain is equal to the amount realized over the adjusted basis of the property. Appellant claimed a stepped-up basis in the property resulting from amounts characterized generically as contributions. This is shown in Respondent's Exhibit Y. Appellant has failed to provide any underlying documentation substantiating this self-prepared worksheet. Council testified a moment ago that there was a new roof and other maintenance done on the property, but has not provided support. Unsupported assertions are insufficient to carry a taxpayer's burden, and respondent's determination must be sustained. This concludes respondent's argument. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Let me uh, again turn to the panel to see if there are any questions. Uh, Judge? You come checking in. Any questions for respondent? I have no question. Thank you. Thank you. And Judge Reiner, any questions? Uh, yes. Um, so just to clarify for the record, for 2011, on the California tax return, appellants did not claim the loss. Is that is that correct? They backed out a vast majority. So I believe there was around twelve thousand dollars of the total four hundred fifty-five thousand dollars that was backed out. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Twelve thousand was remaining. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, no further questions. I, I do have one, one question. Um, I, I believe you mentioned that appellant was personally acquainted with the prior owners. Is there anything you can point out in exhibits to, that would show that? Yes. Um, that is in, bo in both exhibits, uh, resp respondent and appellant. That would be appellant's uh, exhibit four and respondent's <clears throat> Excuse me. Respondent's Exhibit O. That is the declaration of Pamela McMahon. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's now turn to Appellant for his rebuttal. Um, you have up to 13 minutes starting at 2.58 p.m. Please proceed. Thank you very much again. And, and I'll be short and brief. Uh, I won't need that long. Uh, respondent cites to uh, Code Section 183 uh, with regard to uh, profit motivation. One thing you don't hear from respondent is a reference to Mr. Schreier's other real estate investments. I would agree with respondent if this was one parcel or one investment by a small mom and pop on one piece of rental real estate and they weren't collecting rent, it's one thing. And that's looking at it in a vacuum, in my opinion. If you're looking at Mr. Schreier as a professional real estate investor, this is just one and part of his portfolio of many pieces and investments in different real estate. And so I'll say it again. I would agree if, if, if this was one parcel of real estate we're talking about. If this was one rental property and he wasn't collecting rent, on its face you would be curious, well, there's no profit motivation there. This is one in a scheme of things of which he was betting on that he'd make his money at the end of a transaction. Uh, that, that's the one point I like to make. Uh, Mr. Schreier, he, he has a history of investing in real estate, and he loses some in the short term, but typically gains on the long term on the profit side when he's disposing of the assets, and his filings, historical filings reflect that. Uh, uh, to clarify again, and I think this was just brought out, the $455,320 issue arising from 2011-2012, almost all of that was suspended and it was brought into 2012. I would argue that there is issue preclusion there uh, in this matter. There was an MPA issued, there was a consideration, there was an audit, there were findings, and then uh, three years later, two, two and a half, three years later, it was withdrawn. Uh, I would argue that that is an analogous to a findings on the merit. There, there is a, the, the 
assessment notice was withdrawn. The case was over. There was a determination, maybe not by a court of law, but there was by the FTB that there wasn't a case there. And so I would argue that that preserves that $455,000 loss issue rolling up into 2012. Uh, and just the last point I'd like to make, uh, respondent indicates that on the 2012 return, that $455,000 number was not claimed. Well, that's because it wasn't until 2020, September of 2020, that the actual NPA was withdrawn. So that was an at issue until 2020. Uh, you're talking about a 2012 tax return. So he wouldn't have taken that during that time frame. That, that wouldn't have made sense until that issue was resolved. Nothing further. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for your rebuttal. Again, uh, for one last time, let me check the panel, see if they have an any questions for the party. Uh, Judge Acop Chikian, any final questions for the party? No question, thank you. Thank you. Judge Reiner, any final questions for the party? Actually, yes, please, thank you. Um, this would be for appellant. I have a couple questions, please. Um, you mentioned that your client is, has a, this was just one of, Castle was one of many of his portfolios, um, and he, did do mostly commercial as opposed to real estate. Um, my question is, has he have, um, in his business-like manner, ever let his commercial tenants go this long without a rent? Or is that his normal course of action as his real estate professional? He has. Oftentimes, he invests and maintains, makes improvements to his property. As I, I was referencing the server farms, those server farms were dying on the vine. They were in bankruptcy typically. They'd buy them out, they improve these, they put a ton of money in, and then four, five, six, ten years later is when they make their money. That is historically what he's done. Okay, but um, can you clarify during those four or five, six years between buying and selling for the profit, those tenants, which I'm sure I'm assuming that he had tenants during that time, did he have a habit of allowing his tenants to not pay rent? Oftentimes they didn't. Uh, oftentimes they did. He was losing money each and every year until the property was sold. That's my point. Uh, I don't have specific information about how well he collected or didn't collect. My understanding was they were loss leaders essentially until the disposition. Okay, thank you. Um, also, is you mentioned that he sold at a they sold at a loss in 2012 for Castle. Was there a reason why he decided at that time to sell it, even though it was at a loss? That's a good question, and I don't have that answer. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it was the expectation of the market coming back, and it was still really iffy uh, at that time, uh, or if it was a cash call on another investment, and he just decided to liquidate it. It's speculation on my part. Fair enough. Um, and one more question about Aurora and the chart. Um, I understand there's many entities between Aurora and your client, but there is a connection, and it appears that he did therefore receive some income. Is the, are you claiming he did not? No, I'm not. I, I'm claiming he received he received income. He received distributions from the sale. That's clear. It's on the K-1. It's on all the schedules. But our argument is for federal purposes, of course, it's reportable as, as income for cap gain. And then for Colorado purposes, it, it was reportable, not for California. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I just wanted to make sure. And so then my follow-up question to that is, as an individual, that he received his distributions, but he's also, as you conceded, a resident of California. So he's not a, he wasn't a partial resident, he wasn't a non-resident, so as a California resident, he did receive income from that sale. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no you. further questions. Thank you, Judge Reiner. Um, I do have a few questions. Uh, I'll start with Appellant. Uh, can you talk about <coughs> uh, Mr. Stry's personal relationship with uh, the prior owners? I was not aware uh, prior to this case that there was a personal relationship. I, I, you know, I can tell you from my own personal relationship with Mr. Schreier is he is motivated day and night for profit. Uh, he, he's not the type of real estate investor that wants to lose any money, and he oftentimes uh, does very well. Thank you. Um, you. You talked earlier about the um, CPA firms preparing the returns for the partnership entities. My question is, were those firms aware of where Mr. Trier was a resident of? Yes, because they, rep they prepared the K-1s uh, with his uh, name and address on the K-1s. Thank you. Let, let me now turn to the Franchise Tax Board. Um, the FTB submitted a 
exhibits C C through E E. Um, it appears similar <laughs> to appellant's exhibits thirteen through fifteen. Are, are there any differences that FTB would like to point out? No specific difference we'd like to point out. However, to the extent that the panel might consider any differences relevant, um, FTB, you know, we we provided our own copies of those. We we weren't sure what appellant's purpose for including those documents were, and we just wanted to make sure that FTB had its own. Uh, documents because we didn't have time to fully review uh, the uh, appellant's exhibits of those same returns. Thank you. The judge, if I could, I, I think the difference in the exhibits is the appellant's exhibits include the state returns. Okay. I think that's the distinction. And it's the entire complete return for each of those entities. Thank you. Um, still on, on the FTB here, um, why, why did the FTB issue a revised NPA for 2012. Right. So um, the 2011 NPA was primarily about rental income, uh, if, if I believe it's in the record, um, and it also involved another appellant, uh, Mr. Schreier's then spouse, and they they had filed a married married filing jointly return in 2011. So withdrawing the 2011 NPA was respondent's way of simultane simultaneously simplifying the appeal, rectifying the auditor's mistake, and you know, ex in a way, extending an olive branch to the appellant. We did give up a small amount of income, but as noted earlier, we felt respondent felt that uh, the NPA was simply not sustainable, just due to the fact that the vast majority of, well, all of the adjustment for 2011 was with regard to that uh, rental loss. And not only that, we had a rental loss that the appellant claimed in 2012 and naturally assumed that this issue was still at play. I believe it is under the law. I, I, I believe we've you know, set forth the legal authorities that uh, show that this loss has not been foreclosed, uh, especially since it's being claimed now in 2011, um, excuse me, 2012. Thank you. Um, the revised NPA, it, it has this language, um, the, the State Board of Equal, like, Equalization Considered Your Appeal. Uh, this oh, was, yeah. Can I you... apologize, Judge. Are, are you talking about the revised NPA for 2012? Yeah. Yes, uh, forgive me. I uh, would have to go back to the record, but I know we had made, I believe, a downward adjustment uh, for I, th I believe, and I may may be incorrect on this, but my if my memory serves me correct, that that revised NPA was um, produced during the um, briefing stage, and we had uh, given the appellant an increased basis in the property based on the escrow statement or one of the s purchase statements. When the appellant purchased the property, I believe the auditor allowed a $3,800,000 basis for the purchase of the property. And uh, on the escrow or one of the purchase statements, that number was a little higher. So we actually gave appellant a higher basis. And that reduced the 2012 deficiency. And we um, produced that revised NPA based on that figure. Thank you. And, and I, I just want to um, touch on the, the language in the NP that says that the SBE considered the appeal and you're revising the NPA based on the SBE appeal. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, my apologies, Judge. This language appears to be form language that was typed up by our... Um, staff who created this NPA. However, obviously, the Board of Equalization was not in existence at the time. So I apologize for that. Thank you for, so much for the clarification. Um, I do have another question. Um, for the 2011 tax year, should the M FTB had issued a notice of proposed carryover adjustment? 
we hadn't considered that. I would have to get back to you on that. But my understanding, again, is that when a loss is claimed, here it's being claimed affirmatively, as as you know. So um, I'm not sure that we would um, have issued one of those notices. However, again, my understanding is that since a loss is being claimed in 2012, this is the year in which it would be allowed, disallowed, litigated, et cetera. Judge, are you asking if um, in 2011 that they, there should have been a, a notice of carryover adjustment issued? Yes. Yeah, so a notice of carryover adjustment is typically issued in, in a year where there's going to be a change, but there is no other action taken. So in 2011, we had issued a notice of proposed assessment. We had, we had pulled it because we didn't think that it was sustainable. But we didn't issue a notice of carryover adjustment for that year because there was a notice of proposed assessment originally. Had this all happened at the same time correctly without having this issue with the 2011 MPA, there wouldn't be a need for a notice of carryover adjustment. So at the time that we did that, we didn't have to issue that. But the way of rectifying that was by putting this on a 2012 MPA. Um, and we're also able to adjust in the year of carryover rather than in the year of um, of the generation of the loss. So you don't have to issue a carryover adjustment notice in the year of generation. You can also just do an MPA in in a later year of a loss, the use of the loss. And then what we would do is anything that in the future, if we needed to not have an MPA but needed to change a carryover to, for the future, we could issue a notice of proposed carryover adjustment. Thank you. Um, I have no further questions. Um, is there any last comments by our party? No, thank you, Judge. Thank you, panel. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, nothing further from respondent. Thank you. So that will conclude our hearing. Thank you, everyone, for coming in today. This case is submitted on February 14, 2023, and the record is now closed. The judges will meet and decide your case later on, and we will send you a written opinion of our decision within 100 days. Today's hearing in the appeal of Shire is now adjourned.